what we're going to learn about this blend of coffee is that it actually is pretty complex, which is something we can often expect and is probably even the reason behind why we, um, why we do good. Thanks, Julie. Um, good. Uh, the, the sound is better. Um, the blends really find their heart um, and their reason for being in seeking some complexity, right? Um, so when we talk about single origins and blends, let's get really clear about what we mean. So a single origin coffee is going to be a coffee um, that comes from a very specific area. Now we, of course, are usually breaking down into countries, which are, of course, our political boundaries that have been created over time and those change. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it wasn't you, Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> Check the hearing. Um, so uh, those boundaries, of course, get us into looking closer at a region of coffee growing. And single origins can go all the way down to not just a, a specific country, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it can go all the way down to a, a, a region within that country. You'll often see us list that on our coffee reports. It can get into a sub-region, it can get down to a specific farm, and we might even name a farmer on a bag for a single origin coffee, and then we can get down to even lots within that farm, right? Um, so in theory, we could provide a, um, uh, some lists, some GPS, GPS numbers that could describe really, literally where this coffee came from. Um, and that's been a process of coffee sourcing that folks like Bob Bank, our green bean buyer, and um, his colleagues in the, in the sourcing world have been working on for decades now, right? Is getting closer and closer to farmers. Um, we, we like to think that we are some of the, kind of the pioneers in that process. You know, our original green bean buyer um, really questioning uh, brokerage and how we can get closer to the farmers and get closer down to origin. And so um, that's what single origins are. Very specific coffees, usually often uh, maybe even a, C, uh, a, a single varietal coffee, right? So sometimes when we get into different growing areas and different cultural practices in those growing areas where there's lots of farmers, um, there might be several types of coffee within a single origin. So it's kind of like a, a blend of different varieties that are, are in that Guatemala or that Costa Rica, right? Um, but often single origins narrow all the way down to a specific type of coffee, a, a specific variety of coffee um, in a specific geographical location with a specific terroir. So um, very um, often, you know, we're searching for great coffees, so they're, they're in, in their own ways complex. But of course, it's just one type of coffee. How does that compare to a blend? So a blend is several single origins or perhaps different varieties from an origin or even different um, the same variety from an origin but roasted in different ways right so you might know that when we roast coffee at backdoor from bronson um, every coffee is done by type by origin right regardless of whether it's going to be packaged into a small lot single origin coffee um, like um, our recent Bolivian offering, um, or the Colombia, which was released as well, or our Nori Kori from Papua New Guinea. Those are all single origin coffees that are, you know, when we roast the Nori Kori, that's what we're roasting at that one time. And then it goes off, it uh, begins to degas and cool, it gets packaged. Um, or if the coffee is a combination of those origins that go into a blend, um, each one is done separately. So it might be that within a blend, we have a type of coffee uh, that's a specific coffee from a single origin that we roast this way, at this roast level. That goes off, it degasses, it cools, and it gets prepared to be blended. We then might take the same coffee um, and roast it slightly differently. Um, so someone says they can hardly hear me. So, golly. Um, we really seem to be having problems with our sound these days, and I, I don't know um, how to help with that, frankly, in the moment, I do apologize. Um, I do show that um, I have my mic up pretty full in my mixer here. So I do apologize if you're having a hard time hearing me. Um, 
someone says awesome things. It might have been that that uh, came in later. <laughs> um, so, uh, so again, the copies um, are roasted individually by origin, and then also we might adjust the way we roast a particular coffee um, in order to increase um, the roast profile on that coffee. If we want to, in specifically, if you want to insert it into a blend to add something. Um, and you'll see that's something that we have done with this lovely coffee. And let's take a look at, um, at where you might notice it. So we're going to go to our flavor wheel really quick. And we're and looking at our flavor wheel. Let's, um, uh, Brandon Raisin for the muffin. Great. <laughs> it might actually uh, go very well with today's coffee. So the flavor wheel, as you remember, and we've talked about it before, starts off um, in, the, in the center with some broad categories um, that uh, we notice sensually in aroma and on our palate. And then as we move outward, outward as like rays of the sun from that wheel, things get more and more specific into the types of flavors that we're looking at. So we can take a look at, when we talk about the Dancing Goats coffee, um, we have a bunch of different descriptors we use. Among those, um, and, and, and in different places, um, on the bag, uh, on the website, or on the coffee report, you'll see um, those descriptors called out. So we talk about there being a, a floral quality to the coffee, right? And that's probably more in the aromatics. Um, and then at, there also, as the coffee is, is made, there will be citrus notes, there will be chocolatey notes, and then we also think that in different ways we, when we make it, we have caramel and molasses as well. And then usually at the end, a lingering spice. So we obviously there's a lot on that plate there that kind of demonstrate the qualities of the Dancing Goats blend. Um, and, um, and the reason is because it is a blend. And when I talked about a portion of that coffee being a little bit um, of a darker roast, that's kind of uh, what we're talking about, right? Um, we're talking about that aspect of the coffee, which um, a portion of the blend has roasted a little bit darker, and that goes into the blend. And that's where we're gonna find some of those chocolate notes and some of that, maybe that molasses and that caramel being kind of raised up. I mean, these are complex coffees, right? Um, now, Dancing Goats, um, when, I, when I refer to it as a, as a namesake, what I'm talking about, of course, is the fact that um, the coffee uh, is named after the Dancing Goats coffee bar started so many years ago by Larry and Sherry Shalane in Olympia, Washington. Um, and you'll know probably if that name sounds familiar, it's not just because of the blend, it's because um, we also, uh, of course, have um, our coffee shops, which are called Dancing Goats Coffee Bars. And that's kind of, that's in honor of, uh, of, of that first coffee bar, which worked with Backdoor from Bronson Coffee Roasters for their coffee. Um, now, if you know, um, you've probably heard it before, I'm gonna recap it really quick. Dancing Goats, you see that image there that we have uh, on the website when we're talking about the Dancing Goats blend. Um, the, that, of course, refers back to the legend we tell ourselves about the, the discovery, humans discovering coffee. The story of Kaldi, the goat herd who was out looking for his goats, could not find them. He's in the highlands of Ethiopia, couldn't find them, eventually heard the bells ringing and found them dancing around a tree, nibbling at the leaves and the fruit from the tree. And that, of course, is the coffee tree. And that is how humans often, as is often the case, watch animals interact with something. They eat it, we eat it. And of course, Caldi, you know, saw his goats were excited and dancing. Why, maybe? He tries the berries, of course, gets the fascinating and rejuvenating effect of caffeine. So. It's a long story. We might um, take uh, one of these uh, sessions to go over some of the history of coffee one time if we like. Let us know if you think that would be exciting. Um, but uh, uh, our choice to have Dancing Goats be kind of one of our flagship blends has to do with the fact that because it's a blend and because we're able to take single origins and put them together, um, we are able to 
uh, actually um, control that ultimate flavor, aromatic and flavor experience in the cup across the entire year. So what does that mean? So when we talk about cupping notes here, um, you know, we, we say this is a bold and a toasty blend, right? That's because of that addition of, dark ro of darker roasted coffee that's included in there. But there are multiple coffees in that blend and it does change across time. And the reason for that is because we are actually able to um, manipulate the percentages and the types of coffee inside of the blend, always seeking to capture the same endpoint flavor, either as espresso um, or as a drip coffee. Um, and the reason is because coffee, of course, changes from year to year. We know that when we talk about those single origins, we know that a particular crop in a particular country, um, it might be drier one year than the year before. The coffee will still come out. It will be a lovely coffee, but it will be a different coffee. It will be, it will be slightly different, right? So those ingredient components taken on their own as a single origin, lovely. Um, um, but they are different, right? And they will react differently. And we might choose to roast them differently because of the way that seed is developed within that coffee cherry. Blends really are a way for us to take those different ingredients of origins, combine them in a recipe, and seek to have a consistent sensorial experience at the end. Whether we're making it in espresso or we're making it uh, as a drip coffee, and Dancing Goats is kind of that flagship version of that. Um, it's a coffee that many of us love because of its complexity um, and also because it's such a a, a, a challenge and, a, and, a, and a, a, a challenge of passion and love for the roasting team and the sourcing to constantly be assuring that where that coffee lands when you try it at home or when you come into one of our shops it's always going to be something you recognize right it's going to have some nice dark undertones to it that big mouth feel it's going to have some citrus qualities for me the reason I put um, uh, orange onto that plate is, I, it, we say citrus, but for me, it really is, it seems to always be orange. Cherry is another quality that um, folks often talk about um, with, uh, with the coffee. So um, I think all those things are true. Uh, and the key really is how do we um, recreate the experience um, at home, right? So. We're going to notice, we're going to put in some links here. You know that we, we have scales online here. And you, you, might have, you might be seeing uh, us constantly talking about um, using scales and measurement with copy um, production. And this is going to be a great copy to talk about why um, scales and weights are important, but also why temperature is important. And it has to do with that dark roast component that I spoke about. So you'll see, um, I'm gonna switch over here really quick, or actually I can, I can hold it up in, in the window here too. So I have my Bona Vita kettle. I'm gonna pre-wet my filter, as we always do with the pour over method in order to um, remove some of the paper qualities. You know, Ben Jones is gonna do a, um, a special uh, test on uh, papers here, I think, coming up. So pour that water off, right? That does a couple of things. It wets the filter and prepares it for saturation. It pre-warms the vessel as well. Um, and then um, it also removes those qualities of paper. So uh, I'm going to turn on my scale. I think you can see it there. Zero it out. Um, I'm going to add my coffee. 44 grams. So if it was uh, 40 grams, I would probably um, try to do a 1 to 16 ratio. Um, so that'd be about 640 grams of water. Um, but I'm going to go a little bit higher to 700 because of it. it's 44, right? So there's a, there's a relationship in when we, when we um, are making the coffee. We want there to be the right amount of water for the amount of coffee that we have. In this case, we use the, um, the ratio of 1 I'm choosing 1 to 16. It can be 1 to 15, it can be 1 to 17. It's really up to you. You can experiment with that. The only way you can experiment with it, though, is if you're using a scale. 
in order to be able to have, have the, the control of measurement. So there's my number 44. That's the coffee I'm starting with. Now I want you to look over at something else here. This is the temperature on my, um, on my Bona Vida. So if you can see right here, um, it show at 196. Now we often talk about coffees as brewing, quote unquote, right off the boil, right? So water does not boil at 196, it boils at a higher level than that. So often for coffees, when they are um, lighter in the roast pro profile, we can go ahead and use those higher temperatures. However, when there is a coffee that has a darker roast to it, or even an element of the coffee, and in this case, blend a portion of the blend with a little bit darker roast, we want that there to capture again, those lovely deep flavors of caramel and chocolate and molasses that we love so much in this coffee that balance out the, the acidity and the brightness of the coffee and, and, and augment the spice notes. However, when coffee roasts, um, it becomes, in a sense, more brittle, right? And thus more porous. And when it's more porous, that means that water can extract things from it easier. So, um, if we were to use a higher temperature water um, with a darker roast coffee, we might experience some of those things that sometimes people talk about, you know, with some other um, darker, famously darker roasted coffees where it tastes more like, you know, too smoky. Or I'm just going to say, like maybe people have heard it said, oh, I don't like dark roasts because it tastes like an ashtray. Well, there is a solution for that. And that is simply to lower the temperature of the water they're using to brew. Um, the, even though that this is not really a dark roasted coffee, we wouldn't claim that like an Italian roast or a French roast, which we do have. Um, this has a component of dark roast in it. Because again, as a blend, we want to capture those elements. So what we're gonna to do to be able to capture those elements, but not to have them outweigh the other qualities of the coffees, we're just gonna simply lower the temperature of our water as we brew our coffee, right? So um, the great thing about the variable temperature kettle here is that you get to control the temperature of the water. That's the term variable temperature, right? <laughs> Didn't need to tell you that. Um, there's a couple of buttons here. You know, you can, we have temperature sets, which you can go in and make. And um, in this case, I have there 196 as a set, right? So I'm going to set it there. Um, you can also, and you can pre-program those right here in the kettle. You can set it at, you can have a temperature setting at 196. You can have one at 204. You can have one at 180. Um, if you're a tea drinker, and I'm going to do a, a little bit of a tea special here, even though we're not a tea company, it's been asked to do a little deep dive into tea. So we're going to do that probably next week. Tea, if you, if you drink tea at home as well, or if one person in the house is a tea drinker and the other person is a, uh, a, a coffee drinker, then absolutely, for sure, it's great to get one of these kettles because um, you know that with green teas versus black teas versus oolong teas, those all need different temperatures. Well, we're going to show today that the same is true for some coffees as well because of the roast profile. So we're going to go back to um, our, 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 our shot here. Uh, and we're going to start this. Now look here, remember, it just changed. <laughs> we're going to zero that out because we want to begin our timer. And let me show that to you there if you can see it. Um, and we're going to bloom the coffee. That means I want to pour just enough water to get it just about double the amount of coffee that I had there, a little bit over, 92. And I'm just going to sit for 30 seconds. Right? And what that does, um, if you all recall, um, is that actually allows the coffee to, the water to begin getting in between the coffee grounds and also begins an exchange of water for gas that's, that's still bound up next to that, in that coffee ground, uh, the ground coffee, I should say. Um, and it prepares those grind those grounds to be saturated with water gets the gas out of the way You can see the bubbles rising up And now we actually begin our brew Now that first pour we don't re-zero right we just use that to to know how much we had I'm gonna keep this kind of low You know it's looking going in circles right? 
half the amount right there. And that's about at about a minute and a half into the brew. Um, so again, we're using a lower temperature water. Another thing you can do to kind of control for that component of dark roast is you can um, have a faster um, expression time. I would prefer to lower my temperature of water. One of the reasons um, why dark roasts are often a component of espressos um, is because of that short window of opportunity, right, that we have with espresso to actually uh, extract what we want. And so the dark roast can help with that. Remember, whether if the water's too hot or if you sit, to, uh, you know, quote unquote, too long, in either situation, um, because those darker roasts or that component of dark roast is so, so soluble, you might pull out those things, those woody qualities, those ashy qualities that are not part of what we're trying to do with the darker roast. What we're trying to do with that darker roast is increase the quality of those sugars, right? That de full development of those sugars, which go over into that browning process and uh, into it right up into the edge of caramelization. Um, you know, as, as, a, as a chemistry term, right? Okay, so, I'm getting uh, up to 640, coming across 640, and I'm getting 670 right near the end, maybe 700, maybe a full 700 here. Boom, boom, boom. See, that's the great thing about these kettles. You're able to really control your water, how quickly it goes in, and the direction. You can point it directly onto grounds which haven't been saturated yet. And now, I'm going to do a thing here which I like to do with these pour over methods. I'm just going to swirl it a little bit. You see the bed of the coffee kind of move around there. Um, the reason I'm doing that is because um, actually uh, want to pull away the grounds from the edge, from where the, from where the coffee um, is kind of laying up against the edge, because if it's up there, it's not being extracted. I want to stay in that slurry of coffee that has water in it, that is, you know, allowing the qualities in the, of the coffee to be extracted into the water, passed into the water, and then the water passes down through the filter. Um, just wanted to check in a little bit with how folks are doing here. Uh, oh, a lot, of, a lot of folks talking here. So yes, love dancing goats. Don't you know it? Um, yes, I love dancing goats as well. Um, <laughs> uh, what else do we have here today? So, um, hope the brand raising is working well. Um, can we just, okay, that's about the mic. Yes, we did that. Uh, Kat says she loves dancing goats, coffee bars. I do too. Um, and the good news is that, you know, we've worked really hard. If you live in Olympia or Atlanta, um, on creating environments that um, in the most of our coffee bars now where um, it's a safe environment for our staff to work and to serve you and where you can still go in and, um, and get some dancing goats as espresso um, or uh, get some dancing goats to take home as well. So I just want to remind folks there, um, although we're meeting here in a virtual space and um, and we like to you know support your ability to um, to use a virtual space, we also uh, um, like to make sure that you are able to um, come and visit us in those coffee bars, right? So just know that those are um, those are spaces that we work really hard to to balance um, the need to be a business, but also to be absolutely we have to be safe, and we have to um, you know do what's best for our staff and for you, frankly, right? And those those things are all combined. So. Um, if there's any questions, um, now would be a good time. We are at the end of the brew, so I'm going to pour this coffee. Um, I wanted to remind everyone, of course, um, as I always do, um, that uh, do, do, do. we, of course, have... Let's see, I bring it up to the top here. Nope. Uh, almost, almost. Our coupon right um, and I want to also make sure that you guys can see that we do have um, the Bonavita Vida kettle available and I have a link for it here I'm gonna send to you um, where is it no it's not here 
Hold on, I'll find it here in just a second. I'm going to send the link out here. I want you to take a look at that kettle. Um, um, go ahead and jump onto that link. You know that, um, and I'll pop into it over here really quick too, just so you can, uh, just so you guys can, can see it. Um, boom. Go over to our webpage here. You know, Dancing Goats Blend. I was already on the coffee report there. You saw that. But let's go up here to Brewers and Accessories. Let's go to Accessories. Now, in Accessories, you're going to see our scales, right? We have two different types of scale. Today, I was using the Ascali. Um, but here's that one that would be that variable temperature kettle right here. And let's just, let's go through the process here, just so that you know that that 10% uh, discount, um, we're going to add it to our cart. We can go up to our cart. Now, I'm going to demonstrate this. <laughs> Uh, now it, it gives us a notice if we're ordering coffee today that um, that we of course we're not we we're already roasting coffee right now we roast four days a week and and so coffee is ordered today whenever you order coffee it gets roasted the following day so it just always lets you know that that's the case here uh, and I'm gonna put in the code there watch and learn ten I'm gonna apply the code and then. There's our reduced price. So again, that that ten percent discount that you get from using um, our code, it's good for everything, right? So there it is again, right? Watch and learn ten. Please make use of it. Um, it's uh, it's something we want to share so that you are able to, um, you know, kind of increase uh, your ability to uh, to brew coffee at home. And uh, I'm gonna over here so it's out of my out of my way there um and i'm ready to drink this coffee now so i like to let it sit for just a second there um when you're using a chemix or anything where you have the vessel you just give it a little swirl you know um just because you know different components come out of the coffee at different times in the brewing cycle um it's kind of like a layering effect possibly so just a little bit of a agitation there at the end after you have your coffee ready Kind of make sure that um, that you have everything together in one cup. Um, here it is, dancing goats. Mm. Roasted, a little bit of roasted nut, and absolutely that caramel quality is there today. It's delicious, delicious coffee. Um, uh, so, uh, folks, uh, thank you so much for uh, watching us today. Really appreciate it. I'll follow up because um, I see we're having some uh, some restream issues with getting um, links out, and I'll follow up in the comments after this is over to make sure that um, the links for the kettle, the link for the kettle, the link for the dancing goats are in there. Um, and uh, I hope you have a great day. We're going to uh, uh, I'm going to take off right now. I have uh, a few things to do around the house, but uh, I think I will probably on my own finish this Chemex. I don't know. It's a lot of coffee. You think I can do it? I think I can do it. Um, I appreciate you taking this deeper dive with me today as we experience the Dancing Goats blend. I hope uh, you learned something. And by all means, share the, these videos with your friends because they get to use the code as well. Um, and um, we will go through and when I, this on this Friday, what I'll do is I'll look back at all the shares. We'll pull a name at random and I'll send a coffee gift out to uh, to folks who have shared these videos with their friends on their on their timelines and their news feeds right thanks so much uh kristen thank you eric good to see you you guys have a great day and uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m <laughs>